for you and for all of us who are or who have ever been a part of a dysfunctional family. Anybody you would say, my family is dysfunctional. Yeah, uh, all right. The rest of you, it's, it's you. Okay, so, no. You know, when you're reading, when you're reading God's Word, see if you have had this experience, when you're reading the Bible, if you come to a section, have you, have you ever come to a section that you kind of practice speed reading? You're like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, you're just not, you're not engaged, you're not interested in that section. You know what I'm talking about, anybody, you understand? Maybe you started out strong reading through the Bible in a year, and you read through Genesis, and it was like, this is cool. It's a great storyline through Genesis. You get to Exodus, you get the Ten Commandments, and it's still, it loses a little momentum, but you're still reading. Then you get to Leviticus, a little tough, right, all the rules and regulation, and then you hit Numbers which is so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And you, if you're like me, probably didn't like heavily investigate like reading and studying through those names. I've done that. But oftentimes we kind of just kind of skim read that part. Are you with me? Do you, want, do you understand what I'm saying? All right. So that is the inspiration really for this series is a genealogy. There are two genealogies found in the New Testament, uh, both for... Jesus. Uh, one is found in the book of Matthew. One is found in the book of Luke. And uh, they list Jesus' descendants. Now, for the sake of understanding, those lists are significantly different. Matthew starts with Abraham and he moves towards Jesus. Luke starts with Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam. And the names found in the family tree are significantly different. And you're left to like, wait a minute. Now, some, some critics have used that to say that, aha, contradiction. But what they don't understand is the purpose for the two different lists. They're, they're actually very different. Uh, Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, right? That's, the, that's who he's writing to, are Jewish people. And so, unfortunately, in, in that culture, women didn't have, any, uh, have a whole lot of pull. And so what mattered was the father's line. And so it's actually a genealogy of his stepdad, Joseph, right? Not his biological father, that's God, but it was the line of Joseph. Luke was written to Gentile, specifically Greek readers, and he gave the lineage of Mary, uh, his blood mother. And so very, very different. Uh, again, those things are, uh, we would expect very different lists. And in fact, we'd be concerned if the list were identical at that point. Uh, that may happen in some parts of the United States and some parts of the world, but that's not something that we would expect to happen here. Now, when you look at the family tree of Jesus, we, we're, we're left to conclude one thing. When you, when you read through and you read the names, we're left with this conclusion. They were messed up. Right, his family tree, if you shook it, there were some fruits and nuts that were fallen. All right? He had, some, he had some messed up people in his family tree. There were some liars, adulterers, murderers. There was a deceiver. There was a prostitute. There was somebody who had visited a prostitute and later found out that she was his daughter-in-law. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, it was a, this is stuff that happens. There were some wicked kings in there. There was a pagan uh, or two in there, as well as several people who we don't know anything about. They're kind of nobodies. They're only mentioned in this one place in Scripture. And I like what one author said about all this. He says, what all this tells us is that God writes straight with crooked lines. Right? He doesn't need perfect people. He can take some messed up people and write his story or history. So Christianity isn't just for the pure, the talented, the good, the humble, the honest you know, nobody is so bad, so insignificant, so devoid of talent, or so outside the circle of faith, or so dysfunctional that he or she is outside the story of Christ. And so I see his genealogy as showing us that God can redeem and use our family's dysfunction for, for his kingdom's function. And I like that. So if God used a messed up family tree for his son, he can use yours too. Can we say that together? If God used a messed up family tree for his son, 
he can use mine too. All right, we should probably point at ourselves right then. He can use mine too. So in this series, we're going to look at some of the people in the genealogy of Christ and study their dysfunction and see if we can learn anything from them for our families today. I also want to note, we're not going in any chronological order. So if that means something to you, I'm sorry. It's, we're just not going to go in chronological order with this. Now today I want to start with David. Now we did a series on David just a few months ago called Mixtape. And we were looking at some of the, uh, the stories of David, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But one thing we did not, we saved this story for this series. Uh, I knew we were going to be doing this series, and I wanted to save the story for now. So if we can take anything away from this story in David's life, I think here's a couple of things. If we are parents, for those of us that are parents, we need to be on the lookout for patterns in our own lives that we don't want to pass on to our kids? Is there some stuff in my life that I don't want to pass on to my kids? We need to look at that. The second thing is if you're not a parent or you're not married, you know, how does the message apply to you? Because we're going to be talking about a family. To the best of your ability, I think this is how it, it applies to you. To the best of your ability, deal with your stuff, right? How many of you have stuff? My hand's up. All right, we all have stuff. Deal with your stuff to the best of your ability. Don't bury it. Don't ignore it. Deal with it. You're going to be a better friend. You're going to be a better coworker. You're going to be buried better when you do or if you do get married. You're going to be better if you do or if, when you have children. You're going to be a better spouse and a better parent. Now, let's get to David. The story uh, is developed over six chapters and I'm going to read all of them to you this morning. Not really. Can I get an amen for that? You know, he's not reading six chapters. So I'm going to give you the flyover. I'm going to give you the cliff note version uh, of the story. So it starts in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And David sins, and this is a very familiar part of the story. David sins with Bathsheba. And then he gets her pregnant. And uh, he goes to cover it up by sending uh, you know, he has an elaborate plan first to call her husband back from the front lines, hoping that they enjoy a lovely evening together, and they don't. And so then he sends Uriah back to the front lines with a note that he's carrying that basically says, have him go all the way up to the front where the fighting the spear sits and then withdraw from him, right? Kill him. Uh, and so this was the original inspiration for Young and the Restless. You may not be aware of that, but I'm pretty sure it is. I've heard that. I, I believe it's true. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David is confronted by Nathan the prophet, and, he's, you know, and he repents, and he gives, his, uh, he gives his sin to God. Now, that brings us to our story, which starts in chapter 13. One of David's sons, Amnon, and I need you to watch, look at me right now for this, falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. Right, And so part of, the, part of the dysfunction of this family starts with David being married in the first place to multiple women uh, that only have a father in common. And so there's this, you know, a large group of people there that live together. That's the beginning of this. But Amnon lays out a wicked plan, uh, which ends in him raping his half-sister Tamar. Immediately after his Love turned to contempt and hate, and he sent her away in shame. Now, let me step out of the sermon for just a second and say, isn't that how often, isn't that how sin works often? Like, you, you, you're tempted, like, you should do this, you must do this, give in to this, and you're like, I'll just give in, because then I'll feel this relief, and you do, and then it's guilt and shame and disgust. Ever been there? really how sin works. The story of what happened in this messed up family got out. And so Tamar's full brother, Absalom, hears what happens, and he immediately begins to plot murder. It's murder is in his heart immediately. Their father, David, also hears about what happened. 2 Samuel 13, 21 says, When King David heard about what happened, he was very angry. Period. 
aren't you looking for something else here from David? When I read that story, I'm like, what do you mean, period? David, you got some stuff you need to deal with in your household, man. Aren't you expecting a little bit more? Like, and he confronted Amnon and had to be restrained from pulling his sword. Or maybe it's, in, and he had Amnon placed under arrest. It hurt him because he's his son, but he had him arrested. You want something like that? Or at the very least, and he went and comforted Tamar. Nothing. He ignores it. He just gets angry. David felt like, for some reason, and I'm going to give you why I think so, but David felt like he just, he, he couldn't. He couldn't speak into that. Have you ever done that as a parent? Have you ever watched your kids doing or about to do something and you backed off when you should have stepped in and you backed off because of your stuff? Like I can't speak to that because I got my own stuff. Like I messed up in that area. I don't really have a voice to be able to tell him he can't. Continuing the story, and I'll, I'll do this part really quickly, but because David, his father, did nothing, Absalom plotted revenge, which resulted in the murder of Amnon and the fleeing of Absalom. And after a few years, Absalom moves back to Jerusalem. Right? David allows him to move back to Jerusalem, but he's not invited back to the house. He's not invited to the table. David doesn't talk to him. Eventually, Absalom plots an overthrow of his father's kingdom, which results in David fleeing for his life and going into hiding, then finally mustering enough men to send troops into battle against Absalom, which results in his death and David's reinstated kingdom. That all started because David did nothing. It all started when one of his children committed a grave sin and David did nothing. See, here's the question I think we have to wrestle with today, and it's this. Why did David remain silent? And I think it points back to his chapter 11 bankruptcy. When he sinned with Bathsheba and all that took place, David allowed his failure to rob him of his spiritual authority he didn't confront Amnon's dysfunction because of his own. I think this is the truth. Shame shut him up. Because of his shame, with his sin, he said, I can't possibly speak in to this with you because I messed up. And shame has plagued us since Adam and Eve bit into the fruit in Genesis and first realized they were naked. Their first instinct in that moment was to hide from God, right? Why do we hide, especially from God? <laughs> He's pretty good at hide and go seek. But I think it's this. If my friends or my coworkers or people in the church saw me for who I really am, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> if people only knew about my mistakes, my brokenness, my sin, there's no way that they would like me. There's no way they would accept me. There's no way they would want me. There's no way they would love me. And so we write this script when we allow shame to keep us in hiding. That we couldn't, I can't. Here's the question, has shame ever shut you up? Has what you've done in the past ever stopped you from speaking into what's going on in the present? Because shame might be something you can hide behind, but I'll tell you this, it's also something you can die behind. And I wonder how much dysfunction is paid forward to our kids because we think our sin disqualifies, from, disqualifies us from speaking into the lives of our kids and to our children. Instead, how much healthier families we would have if we would do this one thing, own it, don't ignore it own it. Don't ignore it. See, the term dysfunctional is defined this way, relating badly, characterized by an inability to function emotionally or as a social unit. The second one is not performing as expected or failing to perform an expected function. See, when we don't deal directly with our own dysfunction, it can get passed on to the next generation. And we know this, right? Boys who witness domestic violence in their own home are 300% more likely to become batterers 
when they're adults. Or children of alcoholics are much more likely to perpetuate the cycle of alcoholism in their own lives, 400% more likely than the general population. See, one's dysfunctional personal behavior becomes a model or an example to the next generation, and the cycle gets repeated over and over and over again. So here's the question. Do you recognize any pattern, any patterns of dysfunction in your family? Here are some of the more common ones. Controlling or abuse and violence, unpredictability and fear, poor communication, lack of emotional support, perfectionism, right? Whatever unhealthy pattern is present, own it, don't ignore it. See, David owned his sin and he repented in chapter 12, right? Remember that? Chapter 11, the mess happens. Chapter 12, he repents. He gets things right with God this way, but what we learn from that is he doesn't take that and apply it here, right? We have no record whatsoever that he ever said, Michael, which was one of his wives' names. He didn't say, Michael, I'm so sorry that I messed up in that way. Please forgive me. We have no record that he went to any of his other wives, again, part of the dysfunction, but he didn't go to any of his wives according to Scripture's record and repent to them. He didn't repent to his children. He just kind of swept it under the rug, brought a new woman into the house. Eventually they had another child because that first child there died, but they get pregnant again really quickly, and right? We're just one big happy family. He doesn't ever address the dysfunction. So in some way, I do believe we know this. Shame shut him up. David allowed his past failure to silence him when he heard that one of his sons had done a horrific thing to one of his daughters. And in that moment, the Bible says he got angry, period. He was mad. He was mad that Amnon had violated his sister. It was reprehensible but he didn't punish him, he didn't address it, he simply ignored it, because I think because he was reminded once again of his sin. And maybe he even blamed himself. You ever done that? You excuse this behavior in your child because after all, David goes, you know, I messed up, it was lust that took me down, I can't really blame him for that because it's what was in my heart and so this is really my fault and so shame shut his mouth. Can I ask you, was that good for his children, (laughs) that shame shut him up? I don't think so. See, in this story, I think there's at least three huge mistakes that David made. Number one is he didn't respond when response was needed. Right, there was a response that was needed, and David didn't respond. He didn't confront Amnon. He didn't comfort Tamar. He didn't recognize the rage building in Absalom. He ignored it all. Second thing he didn't do. He didn't forgive. After Absalom murders Amnon and all that transpired, David finally brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. He welcomed him back in the city, but he refused to speak to him. Chapter 14, verse 24 says, Absalom may go to his own house, this is David speaking, but he must never come into my presence. I don't want to see his face. I don't want to talk to him. I will not talk to him. And So he didn't forgive him. He didn't begin a process of restoration, he wouldn't even talk to him. In fact, the Bible makes it clear, it was two years of them living in the same city. They could have ran into each other at Walmart or at Applebee's, and they'd been like, I ain't talking to that guy. I mean, they just, there was dysfunction that was happening. They weren't talking at all. And so during that two years, you know what began to take hold and build up in Absalom's heart? Bitterness. Because he assumed that because he was still on the outs with his dad, that his dad was taking Amnon's side. Because he never confronted Amnon, and now he's getting the cold shoulder from Absalom, or he's giving the cold shoulder to Absalom, and so Absalom's like, he thought Amnon was okay. And so he builds up this bitterness in his heart. In the New Testament, we learn this in Hebrews 12, 15. Watch over each other to make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace and make sure that no one lives with a root of bitterness 
sprouting within them, which will only cause trouble and poison the hearts of many. If that verse has ever been demonstrated in a family, it's demonstrated in David's family right here. A root of bitterness takes root, and it begins to grow up. And by it, many were poisoned, right? In this case, there were men who gave their lives because they lined up behind Absalom and said, we're with you, you're now the king. And then they died in battle. David missed this poison root growing in Absalom's heart. David didn't lead his family towards grace and forgiveness. He didn't model how to confront sin. He didn't model how to comfort and show love. He didn't model how to extend forgiveness. But he did model how do you ignore the obvious sins that everybody sees and the pains, and how do you spread dysfunction in the household and teach your children to hide instead of, right? Third thing, David refused to express his love. 2 Samuel 18, 5, King David's talking to his commanders in his army. You know, this is, I, if you will, like a pep talk, you know, like go win one for the gift or whatever. I mean, he's, he's giving them some instructions for this battle. And you'd think it would be something like that, like go win one, you know, you can do it. Here's what he says. For my sake, deal gently with young Absalom. He is leading a revolt. He's trying to kill you, to throw you out of government, to take your place. You've got people that are rising up to defend and to do battle with his army. And instead of like, just do what it takes, you'll win the battle, he says, whatever you do, protect, watch out for, deal gently with my son. And then in Chapter 18, beginning with verse 31, there's a messenger that's running back to David to give him the news of the battle and what has happened. And it says this, I have good news for my Lord the King. Today the Lord has rescued you from all those who rebelled against you. And you'd think David would be like, yes, I knew it, we'd win, whatever. And he has one question. What about young Absalom? Is he okay? Like, that's where his, he's his dad. This is his son. And no matter what has happened, he loves his son. And he's going, I don't care about the battle. I, I, great, we won. What about Absalom? The messenger replies, may all of your enemies, my lord, the king, both now and in the future, share the fate of that young man. Right, he's dead. The king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway. He burst into tears. And as he went, he cried, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, my son, my son. I think it's an incredible declaration of love and acceptance even in the midst of a messed up situation. But guess who he never expressed that to? Never told Absalom. He never expressed that love. In fact, he expressed control. <laughs> he, he expressed shame. He never expressed that love. If David, if Absalom would have understood the depth of his father's love, where it was really, I think there might have been a chance to save this family. But love unexpressed always leads to frustration. So own it, don't ignore it. Here are some things I think we need to learn from this story. I think we need to process our failures through the lens of God's grace, right? As fathers and as people in general, we still have to give ourselves permission. We still have to give ourselves license to still function as the leader of our home in spite of our shortcomings, right? Because you're not perfect. Are you aware of that? If you're not, ask your wife. Or maybe not. You should save that for later. Save that for a non-Father's Day because maybe today she'll go, oh, no, you're, you're, you're great, honey. Perfect. You're perfect. See, our kids don't need our perfection. They actually need to see our pursuit of God and our response to failure when we fail. They need to see. In fact, this, I believe this with all my heart. It's better when they can see how you get back up after you fail than it is for them to believe that you never fail. It's way better for them to see you get back up 
and pursue God again. Our failure should create, another thing we should learn, our failure should create a humility in us, not an insecurity in us. Uh, in fact, in the pattern of the Holy Spirit, we should begin parenting our kids not by shaming them, but by reminding them that they were created for something higher. Amnon's actions, and this is so important, and this may free you as a parent, Amnon's actions weren't the responsibility of David. But to respond to his actions was David's responsibility. See, parents are not responsible for our kids' bad decisions. Aren't you glad for that? Right? Not responsible for our kids' bad decisions, but I am responsible to discipline and correct when they happen. That is our responsibility. So own it, don't ignore it. See, this is the lesson we can learn from David's failure. David could have wallowed in shame the rest of his life. I mean, imagine all this taking place. You lost one son because one son murdered the other son who's, who had raped that daughter, and now you've lost this son because of the whole... I mean, this is a mess. And David could have just said... He could have wallowed the rest of, the, uh, rest of his life and said, this is all my fault. He could have wallowed in shame and been ineffective for the rest of his life. Would God have gotten glory from that? No. God gets glory when we actually learn the lessons from a season like that and make sure that we don't continue down that path. Uh, he decided that he wasn't going to make the same mistakes with Solomon. Solomon, at this point, when all this was happening with Absalom, either wasn't born or was a very young child. Very, very small. And so David becomes intentional with Solomon. He had raised at least two foolish sons so far. He said, I'm not going to do the same with Solomon. Proverbs 4, 3 through 9, Solomon writing says, For I too was once the, the delight of my father and cherished by my mother. He had, love had been expressed to him, by the way. I was their beloved child. Then my father, David, taught me, intentional, he taught me saying, never forget my words. If you do everything that I teach you, you will reign in life. So make wisdom your quest. Search for the revelation of God's meaning. Don't let what I say go in one ear and out the other, but stick with wisdom and she will stick with you protecting you throughout your days. She will rescue all those who passionately listen to her voice. Wisdom is the most valuable commodity, so buy it. Revelation knowledge is what you need, so invest in it. Wisdom will exalt you when you exalt her truth. She will lead you to honor and favor. When you live your life by her insights, you will be adorned with beauty and grace, and wisdom's glory will wrap itself around you, making you victorious in the race. Who had taught him all that? David, intentionally. David said, right, I'm not going to get stuck in this cycle of shame, but I'm going to use it. There are other places in Proverbs where Solomon says he has some really strong words for lust. He has some really strong words for the immoral woman and chasing after that. Where do you think he learned that wisdom? <laughs> I think David used this story. David, you, this is... This is how I messed up, son, and this is what it caused. Seek wisdom. Pursue wisdom. No matter what else, go after wisdom. So help others learn wisdom from your mistakes. Because your failure doesn't have to be the last chapter. Your mistakes doesn't have to be the end of the story. We can give our failure to God, and he can use it to help others learn wisdom. So how will you respond to the message? I think there's at least a few questions that we should ask ourselves this morning. Number one, are there mistakes in your life that cause you to not respond to your family's mistakes? That kind of mute your voice? Or how about this? Is shame shutting you up instead of allowing God's grace to be on display when you speak up? Lastly, are there dysfunctions in your own life that you haven't dealt with that you're starting to see surface in your kids? If any of those things are, are true, what do you do? I think we have to recognize our own mistakes, our own sins. We ask God to forgive us. Harder yet, we ask our family. You know, so first we get this right. 
Then we go, family, we ask for grace there. That's harder yet. One more step that's harder even still. We forgive ourselves and we reject shame. When we do that, we set ourselves up for a better future. We use his grace to teach our family and others about the incredible grace of God. And it is incredible. His love for you has never diminished. His love for you is fully expressed, right? He loves you, he expresses that on the cross with arms open wide that says, I love you this much. So he expressed his love. He expresses his grace, his forgiveness. In the midst of your mess, in the midst of your dysfunction, God says here, I love you. I accept you. I'll speak what needs to be spoken. He's a perfect father. James 5.16 holds a wonderful promise for people who want to break the cycle of dysfunction, and it's this. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? So that you may be healed. He doesn't say confess your sins this way. That's a given, right? That's already in there. Confess your sins to God, yes, that's good. And you receive grace. When you do that, you receive forgiveness. But you wanna be healed? Confess your sins to each other. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. Let's not carry the baggage with us and pass it on to our kids. Wouldn't it be better that we experience freedom, that we get to drop the baggage, we get to have freedom and healing from that? So own it, don't ignore it. We're gonna sing this song, Reckless Love, and what an incredible, message that's bound up in that song that his his love is reckless that he chases after the dysfunctional ones running away or running and hiding that God chases us down and he says I love you no matter the cost to himself as we sing that it'd be a good time to thank God it'd be a good time to express that thank that that thanks that he hasn't given up on you that he won't give up on you and if you want prayer this morning, our prayer team will be up here during the song. They'll come up after the song, or they'll still be up here after the song, after the service ends. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you. If you just want somebody to join with you and believe that God's going to help you. Can we do that? Join us in standing this morning. Let's sing this song about God's reckless love.